Hello, everyone. I think we'll get started. Uh, welcome to an introduction to Cloud Foundry core development. My name is Jen Spinney. I'm a software engineer at SUSE. I'm based in Nuremberg, Germany. I've been a CF core contributor for two and a half years on a variety of uh, core open source Cloud Foundry teams. Uh, and I am Luan Santos. I'm a software engineer at Pivotal. I've been there for five years, actually, and on CF as a core contributor for four. Uh, I'm based in San Francisco, but I actually work from home out of Davis, California, which is a few miles away from there. Um, so I work remotely with my teams. The motivation behind this talk um, is to introduce people to the way that we develop Cloud Foundry itself. Um, so the intended audience is either people that use Cloud Foundry and are curious how it works under the hood, or people that are maybe curious about contributing directly to Cloud Foundry and getting involved in this ecosystem. Um, it's a little bit different than most open source projects, which is also what motivated us to do this talk. Um, the way that we do internal development um, is uh, much more pairing focused, much more focused on a bunch of extreme programming principles. So we want to introduce you to how we do development and how to get involved in open source Cloud Foundry development. Uh, Cloud Foundry, just a brief history of where it came from, started from VMware, which is why we still have uh, VCAP services, the VCAP Bosch user, things like that. Um, then it was run by Pivotal. And then in two, 2015, um, it was uh, transferred over to the Cloud Foundry Foundation. Um, it is still heavily contributed to by Pivotal, but they're no longer the company executing it. It's now a fully open source project that's run by an open source foundation. So inside of Cloud Foundry, inside the foundation, we have a lot of open source projects. Uh, for example, we have Diego that you might have just heard about in the previous talk. Um, Diego um, is them thematically related to a bunch of other teams um, that we consider the runtime. So we have this thing called a Project Management Committee, or a PMC, that groups together a bunch of projects that are all thematically related. Uh, this PMC has meetings every other week to double check that everyone's on track with their projects. The project leads come together, discuss what their roadmap is, make sure that everyone is working well together and everyone's direction is aligned. Uh, so here are three examples. Diego CLI Cappy, but the dot, dot, dot here represents there are a whole bunch of other teams in this runtime PMC. Similarly, all the PMC leads then get together um, occasionally and form the PMC council to make sure the PMCs are all aligned and every, you know, everything as an entire Cloud Foundry is on the right path um, and working together. Cloud Foundry is governed by contribution. Uh, that means that you can't just come up as someone that's not involved in Cloud Foundry and say, oh, I think Cloud Foundry needs to go in this direction. You guys should write your code this way. Um, the idea is that the more uh, full-time developers that you devote to open source Cloud Foundry contribution, uh, the more say that you get in technical decisions of Cloud Foundry. The uh, uh, foundation guidelines leave it actually up to the PMC to decide what a dedicated contributor is, um, but the general guideline is someone that's working uh, full time, at least 75% of their time on open source Cloud Foundry projects. So they're not working on proprietary stuff, they're working on the open source teams. And that means working from the common team backlog. They're not working on their particular uh, company's desires, at least 75% of the time, they're working on whatever the open source team has decided is the open source priority. So how does someone become a dedicated contributor? We have a process called the dojo. That is six to 12 weeks on site at a dojo facility. You are pairing, you are immersed in the Cloud Foundry culture of development. You are a normal team member on a real project. This is not some special class you take. It's not some fake project or beginner project. It's a real project. Um, and the idea is to get completely culturally and technically immersed in the Cloud Foundry development culture. The idea is to get uh, very fast onboarded into the code, the architecture of the product, but also how we do TDD, how we use CI, and our development culture in general. 
the first steps to doing a dojo is to contact this email address, cfdojo at cloudfoundry.org, to figure out where there is space on a team for you. Because you're joining a team as a real normal member, there has to be space. They have to want someone on that team. Um, and there are a variety of locations uh, where you can do a dojo. Uh, there are several in the United States. There are two in Europe. Um, so there are a couple options there. The first thing you're going to do after you've decided that there's availability and there's a site where you're willing to travel to if, you, if need be is to do this pair programming phone screen. The idea of this is to uh, make sure that you would be a good fit for this pair programming TDD um, kind of environment um, and make sure it's going to go well during your dojo. If that, screen, if that screen goes okay, uh, then you get on board onto the team like a normal team member. And if the dojo goes well, then you can join a regular team, either in person or remote. So if you had to travel somewhere far to do your dojo, you can continue being a full-time Cloud Foundry contributor remotely after that point. Uh, and a little bit about those themes. Cl Cloud Foundry is really global. Uh, in fact, we have members of the core teams, of the active teams, uh, all over the globe. Uh, you can see on this map, um, th these um, pins on the map, on the map, there are only the active teams, not counting the incubating. If I added the incubating teams here, it would be much more than that. Um, and as of right now, but when we were preparing this talk, we're spending four continents, eight countries, and nine time zones. And we all work together um, to building uh, this, this product that we all, we all like and use. Uh, and some of those teams are actually even distributed amongst themselves. Uh, I mentioned myself, I work remotely from home. Um, and my team has uh, people in San Francisco, in Portland, in Toronto, and in Santa Monica. Um, and we all work together in the same backlog. Uh, that's the Bosch team that I'm working on right now. Um, for all of those distributed teams, they actually follow a fairly similar structure. Um, all of the teams will have one assigned project, product manager. Uh, who is responsible for receiving input from the community, from the PMCs, um, and digesting that input into a uh, roadmap for the team, uh, organizing that into a prioritized list, uh, into a backlog for the engineering to work on, um, making sure that the engineering team always has valuable work to perform. Uh, and they're also responsible for serving as a bridge between their own teams and the rest of the organization uh, via communication with the PMC, on the PMC meetings, on mailing lists, uh, on the community advisory board, uh, and other, uh, other things. Um, the teams are also uh, composed of, of course, engineers. And we actually compose teams in pairs of engineers, not in individuals, uh, because uh, we do pairing for everything, uh, for every development story we work on. Um, so you're going to have at least one pair of engineers on any given team. And their responsibilities is to not only work on the stories that the PM prioritized, uh, work through that backlog, but to ensure that the, rele the, the product is always releasable as much as possible by maintaining and grooming a continuous integration pipeline uh, directly. We're going to talk a little bit about later. Um, and being on a team uh, and being part of the community, the engineers are actually in a great position to provide feedback not only to their own uh, projects that they're working on, but to the teams that they interact with. Uh, so as a, as a member of a team, you have that opportunity to really drive the direction of Cloud Foundry uh, in both small and big ways, depending on um, your interests and all that. Um, Really importantly, the teams are actually not organized in any special hierarchy. Everyone on the team has the same responsibilities. Uh, as Jen was saying, even when you join on the dojo, uh, before you become an official core committer, you're already treated like a, like a core team member. You've joined the team and you work with everyone else, and no one, no one is really, no one is treated specially. We try our best to not have any biases. Uh, of course, we understand that people are different, and everyone has their uh, own skills and experiences, and we try to make use of those uh, by giving opportunities uh, where um, you can use those special skills and experiences in a way that is both beneficial to the project, to yourself, and uh, you're helping grow uh, your peers on the team that you're working on. Um, 
One of those engineers is actually assigned the role of anchor, uh, which is commonly um, misinterpreted as an engineering lead. Um, on Cloud Foundry, the anchor uh, has a role that is a little bit different than your industry standard engineer, engineering lead. Uh, the role is actually to make sure that the team is working together and making sure that the team is successful. Uh, and they do that by working with the product manager and with the rest of the organization uh, to make sure that there isn't anything missing resource-wise uh, and that the team, the team build is balanced uh, and experience and, and skill. Uh, and they are responsible for onboarding or making sure that people that join the team are onboarded successfully, either by pairing with them themselves or by assigning other, mem other members of the team to pairing with them. So again, uh, mentioning the dojo, when you join the dojo, the anchor is uh, the one that is going to be welcoming uh, you there and making sure that you get all the content you need to ramp up. Um, Although the anchor is not expected to be an engineering lead, they will usually be a very technically skilled um, member of the team. And um, they have to try as much as possible to not let that position of leadership that they're put in uh, and not let that uh, affect their uh, view on opinions of the other team members, because we want to favor consensus over uh, just wanting, having your preference be overriding everything else. Um, and finally, there's a few other roles that might apply uh, depending on needs. Uh, you might need a designer for something. You might need a documentation writer. Uh, there's always uh, space for those disciplines depending on the needs of each project. So we've talked a lot, uh, or we've mentioned pairing a lot so far. We haven't really explained what that is or what we mean by pairing. Um, technically, not all Cloud Foundry teams pair or have to pair. It's actually up to the PMC to decide whether each project is going to use the pairing model or the distributed contribution model, which is more similar to other open source projects you might be familiar with. Um, but what we're going to talk about mostly here is pairing because, because it's what makes Cloud Foundry development a little bit different. Um, and it's what all, all the uh, run, runtime core teams use. So it's very, very common within Cloud Foundry core development. So what does it mean to pair for us? It means you have one computer, you have two engineers working at that one shared computer, you often have two monitors, two mice, two keyboards, but you're both controlling the same computer. Everything that you work on, you're collaborating with your pair on. So you pick off a story from the backlog, figure out what you're gonna work on that day, and you immediately start talking about it. It's like regular development, instead of, but instead of everything happening in your head, it's happening through your mouth, you're like, getting feedback constantly from your pair. You're constantly improvise, improving your ideas and getting feedback and iterating. Um, because we all um, need to be pairing on all of the stuff that we write, it means our schedule is a little bit stricter than most other software engineering schedules. We have these two uh, four-hour pairing sessions with lunch in between. We all start at work at the same time. We all leave at the same time. Um, which is a little bit stricter, stricter than what you might be used to, but it's kind of nice because it means you work exactly 40 hours a week and not more. Um, and the pairing time is super, super concentrated. You are focused, you are pairing, there are very few meetings interrupting you, um, and it's generally much more focused than when I've experienced um, individual coding. There are a lot of reasons why we choose to pair. This is something you can probably see on, in Agile conferences or in Agile books. There's a big list of reasons why people should pair. Personally, I find that pairing makes things go way faster. Even though you have two people working on what you theoretically could have one person working on, the velocity is so much faster than what I've seen working on other, in other um, software engineering models. Um, so I recommend, if you haven't tried this before, to try it out and see how it works for you. Um, I've just been super impressed seeing it firsthand, living it every day. Um, it's very, very hard in the beginning. It takes like a couple of months, I'd say, to really get used to it and not be socially exhausted every day, because it is a lot more intense, both socially and technically, and it's tough to get used to in the beginning, um, but then after that initial period, it's awesome. Like, you feel like you're flying. Um, one of our other um, core principles of how we do development is test-driven development, or TDD. That means that when you first sit down to write a story, instead of just coding the solution up, you first write a failing test. The idea is that that test will go green once you've satisfied what that story requires from you. 
By doing this first, before you write the implementation, you're not letting the implementation bias what you later test. It also keeps you focused and keeps you writing just the code you need to make that test go green. It keeps you from over-engineering things too quickly. Um, it keeps you from writing code that isn't tested. Uh, and in general, this is a practice we follow throughout Cloud Foundry. Another key point is continuous integration, or CI. This is your pipeline, so when you push a bit of code, the idea is that you push to something like a develop branch, for example, and then it goes through a series of tests. Then, once it passes these tests, it might get merged up with your master branch, or it might get released into the public. Um, by doing this, we ensure that whatever we put out to the world has been rigorously tested, and we are confident about it. We are confident it's not gonna break people's systems, and, um, and it's also important to keep this thing clear and green and stuff moving through. So if we have to release something quickly that needs to take priority over everything else, it can rush through this pipeline and everything goes well. In the actual Cloud Foundry programming offices, you'll often see these um, CI screens displayed in very large monitors so everyone can see if the CI is green or if it's red and everyone should start freaking out or people get a sense of like, you know, being red is okay, but if it's red all the time, then people get a sense like, oh, there's something really wrong here and it's always on people's minds. Uh, we have a few meetings, not too many, but uh, I'm gonna talk about a few of them. Uh, first of all, Stand-ups, uh, we have them daily. They're very quick. Uh, they're, it's an opportunity for each person on the team to tell the rest of the team what they accomplished or what they struggled with the previous day. Uh, it's a perfect time for you to ask for help, uh, to notify the team of a change in the workflow or just broadcast any type of information uh, in a very quick manner. Uh, again, these don't take very long, usually five to 10 minutes, depending on the size of your team. Uh, usually led by the anchor, uh, although delegating uh, the running of these meetings is something that the anchor might do to help uh, bring the rest of the team up to speed into the process and uh, have other people also prepare to uh, take over that kind of role in the future. Uh, on, on top of talking about what we did uh, the previous day, we also uh, talk a little bit about what we're going to do on the day that is starting, uh, because these happen in the morning. Um, so we assign uh, pairs, who's going to pair with who, uh, that again can be done by the anchor or by someone else on the team. Uh, and it's really interesting that we actually do this, depending on the team, we try to do this almost daily, uh, where if I pair with Jen yesterday, I'm unlikely to pair with her again uh, today, uh, and that helps us spread knowledge really fast uh, across all the engineers on the team. Uh, it's also an opportunity to do a general sync up. Hey, we're gonna have uh, a retro today or we're gonna have this other uh, meeting today or something like that. Uh, and also an opportunity for the PM to notify the team of something important that has come up. Say you have a security vulnerability that you need to patch. Uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna wanna talk about that during that meeting. Uh, but really straightforward. Uh, another meeting we have is the iteration planning meeting. We call it IPM for short. Uh, that's held weekly, uh, usually in the beginning of the week on Mondays. It's an hour long uh, for most teams. And this one is actually led by the product manager. Um, and it's prefaced by a quick, over, quick review of what the work is, that the work that is currently being worked on. Uh, to hash out any major blockers that you might have or broadcast some risk that you discovered uh, or some story that is actually a little bit more difficult than you had foreseen before. Uh, after that, uh, the PM is gonna go over each uh, of the unestimated stories, the stories that we haven't really talked about yet in detail about where that story came from, what's the user value, uh, why is that story a priority uh, and then the engineers have an opportunity to discuss the risks and, and how complicated they think that story is, uh, and then they estimate that story in a point value. And we're gonna talk about what point mean, points mean in a second. Um, so uh, during the IPM, we use a tool called Pivotal Tracker, uh, it's the project, man project management tool that Pivotal has been using for years, and we use it on Cloud Foundry on every project, pretty much. 
Uh, and it allows you to divide uh, your unit's work in three main categories. Uh, chores, uh, which are almost always made by engineers, uh, and they're meant to track work that isn't directly user-facing. You're not really delivering user value directly from implementing a chore. It might be something that speeds up your tests or improves some part of the code base. Uh, and value there is really in the your long-term velocity of your project. Uh, bugs, as the name suggests, are defects. Uh, uh, neither chores or bugs will receive point estimates because they're not actually delivering any user value. Uh, a bug is just fixing something that should have worked in the first place, so we don't actually uh, assign point value to those things. Uh, and then the, really the main thing uh, that we work on are the features, and that's those are the things that are, are delivering direct user-facing um, functionality, uh, and those are those are the, the one the features that the PM will write, uh, or either by receiving input from the community or from um, the PMCs, uh, and get prioritized, and then we assign uh, point values to those. Um, and then points are actually a relative complexity uh, of each feature. They do not translate to time values, uh, at least not the way we use them in, in Cloud Foundry. Uh, they're a notion of the, the meaning of a point really depends on each team. You might have a point might mean something on your team and might mean something a little bit different on, on another team you might join. Uh, but it, what's important is when you join a team, you really understand what that team means with each point. Um, so a lot of teams in, at, at Cloud Foundry will use like uh, point scales that go from one, two, uh, three, five, eight, or something like that. And what time, well, time comes into play when you pick, get points and you spread them over weeks, and that's where you get your velocity. Velocity is the average number of points that a team has been delivering over the past few weeks. Um, it doesn't necessarily represent how many stories you're going to get done in a week, but it gives you a sense of how much can get done in a week. And that's, that's how DPMs will generally plan for, like, when can I get this feature delivered uh, at a general level. Uh, and then third meeting uh, that we have regularly is the retrospective, and we call it a retro for short. Uh, also held weekly, also an hour. This one happens at the end of the week. Um, we do this because a really core part of our process is our ability to iterate and to change, be it in code or in, our, in the process itself. Um, so we, run, we, we have these meetings weekly where we talk about what went well during the week, what didn't go so well, uh, Something, some things that we might want to change. Uh, these meetings are led by the anchor or by someone else that they might assign. Uh, and what's really important in retro is making sure that everyone is heard and making sure that we come up with actionable things to do uh, to solve the problems we notice during uh, one given week. So how do we communicate within Cloud Foundry and how can you communicate with the Cloud Foundry community? Most of our day-to-day -day communication happens over Slack. That's where you can find each team has its own Slack channel. You can uh, reach out to the team that you want, that you know you need to talk to directly there. We also have the CF Dev mailing list for more broad questions, something that might be um, a question that spans over lots of uh, Cloud Foundry components, or it's where we make our own internal announcements. It's kind of a more official channel than our Slack channels. Um, and we also use GitHub a lot for um, code-specific communication. So let's say you want to get involved in Cloud Foundry, you want to get some, um, do some commits, but you are not you know, willing or able to make this kind of large commitment to go to a dojo and become a full-time contributor. How do you still contribute? Um, you can, if you have like a team that wants to develop some major component and add it to Cloud Foundry, um, I think the best place for that is on the CF Dev mailing list. If you uh, send everyone your idea, say, hey, is this, does this fit within Cloud Foundry? What do people think of this? You'll get lots of feedback and eventually figure out a way to get it incorporated if it fits. 
If you have uh, a, a bug you want to report or something that's specific to um, the actual code, um, I would recommend to do that on GitHub directly in the repository that you are concerned with. And if you want to have like a small feature that's scoped to just one team and you don't think it's going to be very controversial, it's not the kind of thing that warrants the entire uh, Cloud Foundry community putting, uh, getting involved in, um, it's probably best to go on Slack and talk to the PM um, of the team where you want to add this feature to. With that, we want to welcome everyone again who hasn't already been a part of the Cloud Foundry community, um, and we're happy to take any questions at this point. How does pairing work if you are doing home office? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was, how does pairing work when you're remote? Um, we have a lot of tools for that. There's like the tech side of it, which is things like, I've used like Screen Hero before, which allows you to share your screen and have two separate mouse cur cursors so you can kind of work um, pretty well remotely. Um, or using something like Tmux or Teammate for terminal sharing. Um, we use a ton of video and voice apps um, for doing all this, th all this stuff. Um, there's also the culture of remote development. It's really important. And this is what I've experienced, because I've been remote pretty much the whole time I've been on Cloud Foundry, except for my dojo. Um, I've experienced that people are very remote friendly, and that's critical to having remote Cloud Foundry development work well, is that the people that are locally in the uh, city where the project is based are always looking out for the remote person, making sure they have a chance to talk, uh, making sure they don't talk over them accidentally in these like video conferencing meetings. And I don't know if Luan has any other thoughts. Yeah, I guess the only thing that I, I would have to say is that while pairing remotely, you just have to be a little bit more vocal because you don't have the, the body cues that you have in person. Uh, but it's something you get used to. Uh, and you as the, well, I as the remote person have to learn to call people out when they're not sending those verbal cues that I can't see on their face. But that's, uh, that's just something you get used to and it works really well actually. And I've seen some teams um, have a video, like this varies per team, but some teams choose to have a constant video running the entire day so you can see the person's facial expressions. Um, some people tell me they like it specifically because when they make jokes, they want to see if the person's actually laughing or like fake laughing or something like that. You know, there's some, there's a human element to seeing a face. Uh, on the team I'm on right now, the services API team, we have a um, video conference running the entire day. So even the people that are locally on site, in, in this case London, they're always on video and they're just typing away. We're all muted the whole day, but we can see each other's faces. We can see who's sitting down, who stood up to go get a coffee or something like that. And it feels a little bit more normal, like you're not remote when you do that. Are there other questions? It doesn't look like it. Okay, well, thank you all for coming.